Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to MGH Live, the online public program series of New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Uh, my name is Samantha Shokin, manager of public programs, and today we will be exploring the story of Witold Pilecki, the Polish resistance leader who is the subject of the new book, The Volunteer, the true story of the resistance hero who infiltrated Auschwitz, out now with Harper Collins. We are joined today by author Jack Fairweather, a former war reporter in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the author of A War of Choice and The Good War. He has served as the Daily Telegraph's Baghdad Bureau Chief and as a video journalist for the Washington Post in Afghanistan. And interviewing Jack today is Dr. Robert Jan van Pelt, museum chief curator and one of the main authorities on the history of Auschwitz. From 1997 to 98, Robert Jan presided over the team that developed the master plan to preserve the Auschwitz camp and participated as an expert witness in the famous case against the British historian and author David Irving, a Holocaust denier. Robert Jan has published widely on the camp, served as a historical advisor on numerous films, and co-curated The Evidence Room, which was exhibited at the Venice Biennale in 2016. So before we get started, I wanted to make just a, a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, we will have time, about 15 minutes or so, for audience Q&A at the end of the program. Um, so, so make sure to hold your questions for the end if you can, and we'll try to do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, and, and please note that this program is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, within the next few days or so. And I will follow up with all of the reg registrants of today's program uh, with an email probably tomorrow with a link to uh, uh, Jack's book uh, for purchase and a link to the video recording of today's program. Uh, so that is it from me. And so without further ado, I will turn it over to Jack and Robert Jan. Hi, um, so my name is Robert Johan Pelt and um, I will be interviewing uh, Jack today, but he is going first to give a presentation. I think, what is it, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, basically uh, presenting some of the core ideas and, and themes of the book. And so I think it would be probably best that Jack, I give you the stage and then uh, when you're done, once you're done, we can start talking about what you just have said. So, it's all yours. Great, Robbie, Jan, and thank you, Samantha, so much, and to the Museum of Jewish Heritage. It's, um, it's so great to have this opportunity to share the story of a truly remarkable man. And I think, in some ways, the best way to begin um, telling you about who Vitol Paletsky was is with a scene that, in some ways, defines so much of, of the man and his legacy. And I'm going to do that by taking you on a, on a tour, a brief tour through his life. So let me start by sharing my screen. I hope you can see that. There we go. All right, super. So, so I'd like you, to, you all to begin picturing a scene with me. It's September the 19th, 1940, just after dawn, and a Polish underground operative named Witold Paletsky is sitting in the Zoliborz district of Warsaw. And I'd like to show you the very, that's the apartment building that he was sitting in on the third floor. And here is Witold in his favorite plaid jacket sitting um, to the left of this in this photograph. Paletsky is 38 years old. He's a reserve officer in the Polish cavalry, a farmer, a devout Catholic, a father of two. And here are a couple of images of his kids in fancy dress. His wife, Maria, who was a local school teacher. And the two of them, Paletsky and his wife, on their wedding day, one of my favorite images. Before the war, Poland had been one of the most pluralistic societies in Europe. Over a tenth of the population is Jewish. That was the scene, of course, for when Hitler's forces invaded Poland. A short campaign 
German forces took full control of the country. Here we see the Wehrmacht marching through Warsaw in October 1939 under the eye of Adolf Hitler. Hitler hadn't at this stage formulated his plans to exterminate Europe's Jews. Instead, he was intent on the destruction of Poland by eliminating its professional classes, its intellectuals. That meant rounding up lawyers, doctors, uh, journalists, writers, even the country's top chess player. Here's some images from the western city of Bidgosh from October 1939 showing a typical roundup. And just to emphasize at this point, the, the Germans were arresting Catholics and Jews alike. It was a sort of indiscriminate roundup in many respects. Over 50,000 Polish nationals were killed in the first few months of the German occupation. Absolutely staggering figure. The following year, in May 1940, the Germans began a new concentration camp in the south of the country. That camp they called Auschwitz. Here we see a pre-war map of uh, Poland. Um, Pletsky came from the eastern part of the country. The top arrow points to that. And then the, the southern arrow, as it were, points to the town of Oswinchim, which the Germans called Auschwitz. Little was known about what was happening inside that camp, but Pletsky had learned from informants that there was a roundup due for Warsaw that very morning in the Zollibosch district. In fact, that was why he was there, because his mission for the underground was to infiltrate the camp and gather evidence of Nazi crimes there. Let's go back to the apartment then. Now imagine the sound of trucks pulling up outside, shouts and gunshots following. Uh, there's a knock on the door. It's the building caretaker. He says, get out whilst you still can. Paletsky doesn't. His mission is to remain. It's his sister-in-law's apartment, apartment, and he's in the room with his nephew, three-year-old boy called Marek. And Paletsky notices that the boy's teddy bear has fallen on the ground. Just as there are sounds of footsteps on the stairwell outside and the door bursts open, Paletsky reaches down and picks up that teddy bear and hands it to the boy, seeing that he was scared and needed reassuring. And then against every instinct he must have had, Paletsky turns towards the German soldiers who have entered the apartment and steps into captivity. Three days later, he arrived in Auschwitz. Here is the gate camps, uh, the, the, the gate to the camp. Those terrible words that we all know, Arbach Mac Fry work sets you free. And here is Paletsky now as a prisoner. Over the next two and a half years, Paletsky forged an underground army in Auschwitz that sabotaged facilities assassinated SS officers and plotted an armed uprising. He was arriving in Auschwitz at its beginning as a concentration camp for Polish nationals. Thus he witnessed the steps by which the Nazis conceived of the final solution for Europe's Jews. He was the first person to seek to warn the world about the horrors of the camp and he was the first to try and stop them. Three years before Allied commanders publicly acknowledged Auschwitz's role, Paletsky was already calling on them through secret messages smuggled out of the camp to destroy Auschwitz. And yet for all of his exploits in Auschwitz, his story is almost unknown. Indeed, I only heard of it by chance. I met up with a a war reporter friend of mine in 2011 and we were talking about our experiences in war zones trying to make sense of our experiences and my friend had just come back from a trip to Auschwitz and had learned about a resistance cell in the camp and I think like a lot of you um, here today uh, that idea that resistance was possible in Auschwitz was just so startling and surprising to me I knew I had to find out more and uh, a year or so later, a report 
of Paletsky's was finally translated into English. And it was the most remarkable document describing in great detail with this rawness and urgency Paletsky's experience in the camp. But it also left unanswered many of the questions that Paletsky himself couldn't have known the answer to, such as what happened to all of the intelligence that he smuggled out of the camp? Why was it that the Allies did not respond to his desperate pleas for action against Auschwitz? So I want to take a moment to pause and, and show you um, where Paletsky's writings uh, were housed uh, for many decades after the war in a, this small uh, West London uh, house in Ealing, it's the Polish Underground Study Trust. And one of the, the great mysteries about Paletsky's story was revealed to me as I began to dig into it, um, which is why have we not heard about this man before? And the answer is, is that after the war, Poland was taken over by Soviet-backed communists and Paletsky fought on against them just as much as he fought against the, the Nazis in Auschwitz and, and afterwards. And he was captured by the communists, executed, and all trace of his wartime record hidden away. And a single report of his was smuggled um, to London at the end of the war and um, housed in this archive. And it wasn't publicized uh, for decades for fear of sparking arrests back home because Paletsky and pretty much anyone in the Polish underground was persecuted by the communists after the war as possible resistors. And um, it took decades for his story to really emerge in Poland. Um, and here is a copy of that report that was sort of sort of kept under wraps for all those years. You can see Paletsky's looping blue handwriting around the edge. And this is the filing cabinet at the Polish Underground Study Trust where that report still sits today. That second shelf from the top, you can see a, a beige folder sitting perpendicular to the shelves. And that is the report. I'm always a little bit amazed to see it there because, you know, in my mind, it should possibly be in the National Archives in Warsaw or even in Yad Vashem, but nope, that's where that remarkable document telling the story of Paletsky's experience in the camp is housed. Uh, Jack, um, yes. I'm getting from the chat, uh, many people who don't seem to be able to see the pictures, so I don't really know what happened. I can see it, but... Um, oh, okay. Um, Um, I can I, I can just try and s maybe we can have another go at re reloading it. I'm not sure if Samantha has any wisdom because it would be a it's a shame if you can't see these images. So I'm going to stop sharing. And maybe, maybe if I just stop, let's try this. Is that any better? Robert Yang, can you see that? It seems to be better. I'm getting some people are saying that they, we can see it, yes, perfect. I'm able to see them just fine. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry for inconvenience. And um, here is the filing, the, the filing cabinet where that report has sat. So, Having acquainted myself with the report, having seen that sort of historical mystery contained in it, you know, those questions about what happened to the intelligence that he gathered. And I think also this sort of personal challenge that I felt from Paletsky's story, trying to understand what would make Paletsky risk everything for such a mission. I also had um, a wife and two kids when I began research like Paletsky, and I really wanted to understand what would drive someone to risk everything on such a mission. So with those questions, I set off to begin gathering material. And I 
Flute of Warsaw in 2016. And the first person I wanted to meet was Andre. Jack, I'm sorry again. Uh, we've had a, many people. Can... Oh, this, you can't say anything? All right, are we? Oh, I think you just um, ended the screen share or turned off your uh, PowerPoint. There, I see you, but not your PowerPoint. Okay, I'm gonna try again and yeah there it is okay that looks good uh, so i flew to um warsaw in 2016 to meet uh remarkably paletsky's son andre i was a little bit nervous about meeting andre because he had just been a child when his father was executed and decades he'd been told that his dad was an enemy of the state and wasn't until the fall of the Iron Curtain that Andre was able to start learning details about his father's mission. And so here was I suddenly alighting on his father's story. You know, who was I to, uh, to write the man's biography? But I shouldn't have worried about meeting Andre because he was the most delightful chap I could hope to meet. Here he is in his Warsaw apartment. He was engaged, compassionate, and curious because he said to me, Jack, I'm not sure what you're going to find out about my dad or where you should start looking. So I looked at Andre and I said, I'm starting with you because when so little is known about your dad and his thinking, anything that you can tell me is going to give me an insight. I write in a style called narrative nonfiction, which means whilst it reads like a novel, everything in the pages of the book has to be true and um, that means that insights that Andre could give me into Paletsky's thinking would be so helpful for me being able to write about what drove Paletsky's actions in the camp. Um, one of the things that really stunned me upon arriving in Warsaw was discovering just how many people were still alive who had known Paletsky or in some cases even fought alongside him and um, even better was when I was able to meet these gentlemen and women and take them to the places where Paletsky had performed some of his deeds. And one of the key places I wanted to go to was that apartment where Paletsky volunteered for his mission. Here it is when I visited it a few days after meeting Andre. And on the third floor, we found the door and we knocked hoping to see inside this historic space and uh, no one answered so at a bit of a loss my researchers suggested as we were there anyway we might as well record some audio of marching up the steps and banging on the door like the Gestapo had done which was a good job that we did because that's what it took to wake the rather sleepy inhabitants inside it was a student DOS house and even though it was about midday they were still fast asleep and uh, completely unaware that this apartment was the scene of a truly historic moment in history. That's the room in which Paletsky volunteered for his mission to Auschwitz from. Okay, so, back, sorry again, we have seem to have the same problem. Uh, people can't see it or maybe I just stop intervening I don't, I don't really know what you can do about I, it's it. Hard to, it's hard to comment on yeah. whether, how many, whether it's a localized issue, whether everyone is <laughs> is failing. I think at this point, Robert, yeah, we should, I'm, I'm near, nearing the end, so I think we should probably just so crack I'm, on. I, I can see it, but uh, I think that I'm one of the few ones. Well, in that case, I'll, I'll just add a line describing the images so that everyone can get a sense for those who can't see it. And the apartment where Paletsky volunteered for his mission, picture in your mind now, a very untidy student apartment. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do was bring, um, bring um, someone who had been in that apartment back there. And um, you may remember that child who had, uh, who Paletsky had comforted just moments before he was arrested. Here he is, Marek, sitting on Paletsky's knee in 1939. Well, it turned out that Marek was still alive 
here he is when I met him in Warsaw, picture now a 80 year old gentleman looking very dapper on the banks of the river. I took him back to the apartment and showed him around. And it was the first time that Marek had been back since the war. And um, returning there pushed him to remember all sorts of details, confirmed the layout of the different bits of furniture in the room. And he also spoke about the moment that Paletsky was arrested. Oh, was uh, one was uh, in an army suit, mm -hmm. German, and another civil. Yes. And they ask mother if there are any men. Mm -hmm. here. There is any man here. Mm -hmm. In this same moment, uncle moved from mm -hmm. from this room. Ask what what's going on? Mm -hmm. What's going on? And he was ready to go, he had his jacket on? Or? I think he was prepared because mm -hmm. he has time to... to yes. No. Yeah. But did, what did he say to you when he was leaving? Did he say anything? Do you remember? He like, see you soon! You, see you soon. Mm -hmm. So, um, that shows a video of Marek describing uh, walking around the apartment showing the moment when the Germans burst in and the video shows him tearing up just a little bit at the end and by the end of that visit he was in tears remembering Paletsky's engagement with his family. So that was part of my approach to telling this story. I wanted to follow in Paletsky's footsteps as much as possible, find those who had known him, take them to the places that they had seen him in action. Um, but I knew I was going to need hundreds of thousands of details. And um, that's when I knew the book would be possible was arriving at the archives at the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum and discovering over three and a half thousand prisoner testimonies, um, hundreds of which described Paletsky in action or describe moments that he would have witnessed. And so I was able to start building up scenes, testing Paletsky's own writing for accuracy and creating a really immersive experience of Paletsky's time in the camp. And you know, this approach was great for giving readers that sense of being alongside Paletsky, but I want to just leave you with a small anecdote about how this approach also helped me solve one of those great mysteries that I began the project with, which was to answer that question, what happened to Paletsky's reports that he smuggled out of the camp? And um, Paletsky describes sending his first report in October 1940, a few weeks after his time in Auschwitz, and he's already witnessed this incredibly brutal atmosphere whereby the Germans would beat, starve to death and brutalize the prisoners who just to emphasize again were Polish nationals, both Jews and Pol uh, and Catholics and Protestants at the stage, but all, all Polish nationals. He witnessed all of this and he knew he had to inform the world. Um, he gives us the name of his messenger, Alexander Wielopolski, but he says no more. No doubt he was concerned that if he had said more in his writing that perhaps after the war, the communists would have tracked him down and arrested him. Armed with that name, my researcher in Warsaw was able to find Alexander's family, his son, and here is a picture of him. Piotr Wielopolski, he had no idea that his dad was Paletsky's first messenger from the camp, but he did know who his dad had stayed with, Dembinsky. And armed with that name, my researcher went back to that, you know, that underground study trust in West London, and there are hundreds of reports from the underground in the archives there. Um, but with that name, she managed to track down a folder, the Dembinsky folder, in which was contained the story of how Paletsky's report 
carried out by Alexander from the camp as a released prisoner, made its way all across occupied Europe to reach the Brits in London. And I described that incredible journey in the book. Um, but I wanted to leave you today with the remarkable message that Pilecki wanted to tell the world in October 1940. This is what he wanted to say. We beg the Polish government for the love of God to bomb the camp and end our torment. Should we die in the attack, it would be a relief given the conditions. This is the urgent and well-considered request sent on behalf of comrades by the witness of their torment. That's to be told Paletsky. When I heard those words, I had goosebumps because they are pretty much verbatim what Paletsky made Alexander memorize whilst he was in the camp. And it's a stunning idea to think what might have happened had the Allies intervened. And I went on to trace up to 10 of Paletsky's reports. Each time I was able to find, using the same sort of process of deductive reasoning and finding family members and retracing journeys, find their, how these reports made their way to London. And the reason why I argue in the book and why I'm so passionate about Paletsky's story, the reason why it's so important is that he charts the steps through his writings by which the Nazis turned Auschwitz into a concentration camp for Polish nationals into the center of the final solution. And his reports are bear witness in this extraordinary way to these different steps. And it's one of history's great what might have been, what would have happened had the world listened sooner. So um, I would like to leave it there and re reconnect with you all. And uh, my sincere apologies for the, the failure of the screen sharing. I'm sure that was frustrating, um, but hopefully Robert, Jan and I can uh, enlighten you with conversation now instead of with images. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, just, just um, uh, I would like to to just clear up a little bit of chronology, if if that's okay. As a historian, yes. of course, chronology is is everything. And um, so Pilecki was there around two and a half years in, in Auschwitz. Yes? yes, he escaped in what is it, April forty three. Yes. So, yes, say, um, so there are really two major phases, or maybe three major phases, in the history of the camp that that he sees. He sees the original, uh, basically the, the the formation of the Polish concentration camp, the, the concentration camp of Polish nationalists, uh, 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 um, fighters, hostages, and so on. Then uh, already in, in, in 41, there is something of a transition when Russian prison wars start arriving there and when the first gassings takes place. And when also you get the mass murder and you describe that in, in some detail of, the, of prisoners who are not deemed to be useful anymore and who are sent in, originally to, a, to gas chambers in Germany itself that are used for the killings of people who are murdered as part of the T4 program, the, um, the program to kill the, the uh, disabled. And then finally, in, in the spring of 1942, Jews start arriving in Auschwitz to be murdered in Auschwitz and also to be put. And uh, initially, they're murdered in, um, in small gas chambers, uh, converted peasant huts, a bunker one, two, and then just as the crematoria with the gas chambers um, are completed. They're taken into kind of, they, they, they're begun, the construction has begun in 42. Then that's exactly the time that Pilecki leaves. Now, I just wonder because there is, of course, quite a, 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 a an extensive kind of literature on reports from outlets. Yeah? And that focuses very much on the reports that actually came out in 1944. And uh, so uh, most famous report is by Rudi Vurba and Alfred Wetzler, uh, a report that, that, that escaped from the camp. They uh, basically tried to warn the Hungarian Jews 
of what awaits them. The Hungarian Jews have not yet been transported to Auschwitz, and that report then uh, reaches at a certain moment Switzerland and then London and Washington. And there is a second, there's another discussion then in the summer of 1944 uh, at the RAF and the uh, United States Army Air Force if Auschwitz should be bombed. And this then is particularly the bombing of the great crematorium of the chambers. And I just would like maybe I'm interested in your sense of the Pilecki report and the Pilecki request, the bombing already in 1940, when Auschwitz is still a relatively small concentration camp. And the final solution doesn't mean at that moment yet side. And the reports that come out in 44 request for bombing at the time. And I wonder. If, if you would be able to reflect a little bit uh, in a kind of, I don't want to say compare and contrast situation, but about those two, the dilemmas that were there in 1940, for example, in London in 1944, the stated credibility of both reports, uh, Gurba Betzler in 44 and Pilati in 94, or the perceived credibility, if you maybe could, could play a little bit with that. Sure, I, I mean, I, and that, th thank you, Robert. Yeah, and that's a great overview, and I think helps sort of show the, the forward trajectory of Paletsky's story. Um, we all know about that debate, or many of us do, in 1944 about whether or not to bomb Auschwitz. And in some ways, it's become a symbol for all of us as to, you know, what we should have done to try and stop the, stop the Holocaust. Um, but of course, what Paletsky's story does is focuses attention on his request many years before that in, in 1940. Um, they are different circumstances and I think it's important to understand the context by which Paletsky's report from the camp is um, considered by the Allied High Command. Um, in uh, December 1940, early 1941, Britain is under attack by the Blitz, um, the, the number of operational bombers that the RAF have is below 200. Um, there is no immediate um, allies or hope of help from, from the Americans. Um, Britain is very much alone. And in some ways, as I came to uncover the discussion in bomber commands between men like uh, the Air Marshal uh, Charles Portal and his subordinate Richard Pierce, I sort of came to appreciate some of their concerns. Um, they debated whether or not to bomb Auschwitz at, uh, and took on board Paletsky's request very seriously. Um, but Richard Pierce actually said something that was quite interesting. I mean, he said he sort of recognized that it would be impossible to reach with British warplanes all the way to Auschwitz, um, which was true. They, there was no radar at that stage. It would have been the longest mission ever undertaken by the RAF. Um, it would have really pushed the bounds of possibility. And Richard Pierce says, look, it it's, would be incredibly difficult to do it, but it would potentially be a political symbol. And, um, and Pierce, you know, is part, in a way is passing the buck because he wants ultimately sort of someone like Churchill to or order it. Um, but that idea is really interesting. The RAF decided against bombing Auschwitz in early 1941 for, for those reasons. But I came to feel um, during research um, that had they tried, however doomed and flawed, it would have been a political symbol, a very powerful one um, in alerting the world both to the existence of Auschwitz, which I mean, it's one of the crazy things about the camp's history is for how long and um, its name was hardly known um, among, um, among the allies. Um, but it would also have created a precedent of trying to stop Nazi atrocities. And that really is a crucial point because two years later, the Americans were on board. There was access then to heavy bombers, liberators, Lancasters that were more than capable of hitting Auschwitz. But when the Allies came again to debate this idea of bombing the camp to stop, uh, to stop the atrocities there, 
they actually referred back to that first debate in, 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 the, in their files to argue as to why they shouldn't bomb Auschwitz. They said, oh, it wouldn't be possible. It would just be a political symbol. And they, you know, that debate in 1944 was being informed by that first request from Paletsky. And, um, you know, I think that's why it's so important to both understand the, the context and for the decision uh, regarding Paletsky's requests, uh, also to see how it then plays out in allied thinking, this constant stepping back from taking action. The interesting thing, of course, is that in 19, you know, one of the great um, problems in the historiography of the allied response to the Holocaust, and now I talk particularly about the Holocaust of the Jews, of course, is that uh, from 1942 onwards, it was always said, you know, uh, that the English and the Americans had to deal with latent anti-Semitism in their own populations, and that any intervention which was explicitly to be done on behalf of the Jews was considered to be unpopular. It would make the war more difficult to fight because it would now become a war to save the Jews. And that was, of course, not something that many people would agree with. And that, of course, in the 1940 debate, the Jewish dimension of Auschwitz did not really exist yet. That it was a primarily a Polish camp, camp for Poles, so that in some way I would say there's kind of the possibility of actually an interesting look at let's let's call it the prejudices, how the prejudices of in this case the military in England, which of course were very much pro-Polish in 1940, they were they thought that the Poles were heroic and 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 very deserving people, and of course an ally, even if they hadn't supported them much in 1939, but they had come to war on their behalf. Uh, a, 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 that would would have, I think, colored and shaded their 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 discussion in a way that in 1944, when it really was now about the Jews in Auschwitz, it might have gone into a different direction. Now, I haven't really compared these discussions from that perspective, but but I think that probably it would it would be a very interesting way to actually look into the souls of these of of these military men and and look at their prejudices. Well, I, I came to I came to the conclusion, <clears throat> and I you know I write about this extensively in the book because for, for me a huge part of Paletsky's story is having his experience in the camp contrasted with what was happening in the Allied capitals, their response to to what he was telling them. Um, I think um, I came to the conclusion that whilst it was understandable the Allied response or the British response in 1941 to that first request by the late 42 into 43 the body of material from Paletsky from many sources um, really made um, action the, the, the lack of action unconscionable and um, you know whilst I take an approach to history that we shouldn't sort of seek to, you know, judge or, you know, you know, overwrite uh, our experiences onto those of the time. Um, I've tried to let everyone have their say, as it were, and present their thinking. Um, it does become a really damning indictment of the failure to take action. Now, there's something else. I mean, I, I had the pleasure of writing once a short biography of, of, uh, of a person a young man who ultimately was killed in the Holocaust, David Coker, because I edited his diary and I had to write a 80 page a biography of him to understand the diary and research his life. And there's a certain moment that it clicks, you know, that, that there's a relationship that this, that you fall in love with the character, that you suddenly get to the core of what the, the man is, both in your case and my man was a man. And so I just would like, to know with Pilecki in the beginning, of course, he's kind of a shadowy figure. And, and, and so what is the moment that you really thought, you know, okay, I know you, who you are now. I, I, I think really I understand you. And then uh, that, that you get this sense of that there is actually a relationship between you and him and that you look forward in some way, you know, shaking his hand to the afterlife. Uh, one well, of the a lot, a lot. <laughs> Uh, Robert, yeah, that's a very nice, very nice thought. Um, you know, I think a lot of the biographer's quest is, you know, this pursuit of your subject, and it often feels like you're playing catch up. 
Um, but I definitely remember the first time where I really felt that I did arrive at the same point in time as Poletsky. And that was when I um, staged a, a recreation of his amazing escape from the camp. And um, it's one reason that I just urge everyone to, um, to read the book because his escape from Auschwitz is, you know, is one of the great wartime escapes from any concentration camp. And um, he, he wrote about it in his report and amazingly, a fellow escaper also wrote about the experience. And so those two narratives together give such a rich experience of what it was like to escape the camp. I wanted to follow in his footsteps. So that meant um, escaping, as it were, from the camp, the same hour, the same day, um, albeit decades later. So um, that meant, you know, at 2 a.m., um, I sort of started making a dash uh, for it um, along the banks of the Sowa, crossing over the same railway bridge that Poletsky had done and, and finding the spot that Poletsky describes in his report, but d doesn't identify otherwise when the sun starts to rise and he makes a dash for it across the fields to where the, uh, the to, to shelter. And Poletsky describes this 100 mile journey across Southern Poland. Um, he names some of the villages, but doesn't say much more. And I visited those villages. I would usually turn up and say, where's the oldest person here? And um, on several occasions, I was introduced to families who had sheltered Poletsky and his two fellow escapers. And um, it, was a, it was a really lovely moment um, reaching the safe house where Poletsky spent some time um, to recuperating um, safe from Nazi clutches. And maybe I can just um, share with you now that's that scene um let's see i know this is asking for trouble here is pletsky and his two fellow escapers this is um the man who uh, oh i'm so sorry uh, that didn't here is the man all right well i won't do full screen here is um pletsky and his escapers here is his host um at that safe house and here is that house today when I got to visit it and that little girl you saw in the years many decades later making me a cup of tea that table you see filled with snacks and is the table where Paletsky sat down and started writing his first thoughts about the camp as a free man and I got to sit at that table and it was a moment, Robert Yan, which I think you may empathize with, where you, you really felt like I had reached, caught up with my subject. And, you know, I got to share in, in that moment, both with the amazing hospitality of my, of my hosts, but also that moment when, you know, I got to reflect on Paletsky's experience in the camp as, as he had done at the, at the same spot. Now, if you were to meet him now, um, what would be the first question you would ask him? <laughs> well, I think for those of you who read through the book, I think, you know, he survives the camp, obviously, through his, through his escape. Um, but when he returns to his family, both you know, immediately after escaping and then in post-war Poland, um, he, he really struggles to connect with his family and, um, you know, there's a real sense of tragedy there. I mean, of course, there are very good reasons. Poland, after the war, was, you know, subjected to a communist takeover, which is just really worth emphasizing for, for everyone here. Um, we think of, the, you know, 1945 as victory parades. That wasn't the experience of of Poland and Polsky was plunged into this new struggle. But within that struggle, you know, he met his family, but couldn't engage with them. And that was really brought home to me by a detail that his son told me that, that Polsky had never spoken to his wife, Maria, about his experience in the camp um, in, in the years afterwards. And that really touched me 
knowing how much Poletsky was thinking, working over his experience, um, you know, that he wasn't able to share it. And one of the last things that he wrote as a free man was also one of his most beautiful. And it was um, talking about sitting with friends in the camp um, knowing that they were going to be executed the next day and then reflecting to him that their great regret in life was that they hadn't shared more with those that they loved. And that was Poletsky's final thoughts as a free man. And, you know, I would, if I could see him, I would just, you know, want to ask him whether, you know, whether he felt that he could at that point start connecting with his family again. Um, I think everyone has had experience of stress and turmoil in their lives. We know how disassociating that can be, how that can sort of drive wedges um, between those we love. And, you know, I would love to think that there was a possibility of redemption because um, I, I think Paletsky offers it in that in those final comments. And it's something maybe we can all take away from his story. I, I would. I, I'm. I'm right now looking at the Q and A, uh, at, at the questions that have been raised, and I'm just picking out if if, if Samantha's okay with that. I will maybe do it. One question, um, uh, which came from Kathy Carr, and uh, basically it's about the title, uh, the book, the Volunteer, and the question, of course, to much to what extent was he really a volunteer in the sense that he was a military professional and that he saw his task, of course, uh, as part of a continuous war that he had fought in the war as, a, as an officer in the, in the, in the uh, while before the capitulation of the Polish army. Of course, the government never capitulated and that this was an, a continuation of it too. So to what extent uh, can you really talk then about this as a volunteer, that he was a volunteer? Uh, because at a certain moment that, that, that would suggest that he had a choice. And if he had a really the, quite a, a, a highly sense of duty and, and professionalism, then in some way you, you might suggest maybe that he was not a volunteer, at least not in relationship to his own super ego, so to speak, his own uber ich. Yeah, well, Katie, that is a great question. I'm not sure if you're Katie Carr, who wrote uh, and who wrote very brilliantly uh, songs about Kazimierz Spierhovsky, one of um, the great escapers in the book that I write about. But if you are, hello, and I love your love your work. It's a great question. The book is called The Volunteer, and that does somewhat summon the image of Paletsky sort of raising his hand, saying, you know, I'll I'll do it. Um, the story of the how his mission was conceived is such an important one because it really cuts to the heart of something um, about Paletsky that is, informs so much of his time in the camp. And that is this, Paletsky doesn't write much about politics other than to say he doesn't like politics and politicians and the way that they use issues to divide people. But there is one great political act in his life, and that is when he stands up to his boss in the underground. Um, this is shortly after the Germans have occupied Warsaw, and he's taken up the fight against them. His boss wants to publish a manifesto that's chauvinistic, nationalistic, defines Poland as being Catholic and, you know, only for Catholic Poles. And, and for Pletsky, it's clearly divisive. And he takes a stand against his boss. He insists that he sign up with the main Polish underground that has a much more inclusive agenda. And his boss does. Um, but in doing so, he volunteers Pletsky for a mission, a mission to Auschwitz. And, um, you know, it's such an important scene in the book because, you know, that really tells us a lot about who Paletsky was, that he was taking a stand in the name of having a Poland that was inclusive, in which everyone banded together to fight the Nazis. Of course, he still had to decide to take the mission. That's one thing that his boss said to him, you know, this is pretty dangerous, to be told. Um, so I'm going to have to ask you, to volunteer. Now, of course, 
from a man of duty and patriotism being told here is a mission, you can do it if you want to or, or leave it. Of course, it was an impossible decision for Pelecki. He still avoided the first roundup that could have got him sent to the camp as he was struggling with this decision. But in the end, of course, he did go. And that for me is, you know, is the essence of volunteering that willing choice and um, why that scene that I began the presentation with is just so important for me because it's that moment when he set aside, decided to leave behind his family, his immediate circle, everything you think he might be concerned with in order to begin this, this extraordinary journey. Now, um, one of the one of the people, of course, who uh, is very famous as a uh, as, as 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 a man who informed, uh, especially about the Holocaust of the Jews in Poland, uh, is Jan Karski. And he, one of the reasons he became very famous, of course, is also because of his appearance in the movie Shoah, where he gives incredible testimony, and it's it's very important in the movie. Now. One of the interesting things is that right at the beginning of the testimony, as it's presented in the movie Shoah, um, Karski, when he goes into the ghetto, so he's invited by Jewish leaders, a Bund leader uh, in the world, to go into the Warsaw Ghetto to see for himself what's happening inside the ghetto in 1942, so that he can, in some way, when he goes to the Allied capitals, he can see, I've seen it with my own eyes. I can bear witness to something I've seen. This is not hearsay. And Kursky, very interestingly, who is an aristocrat, he, he's a Polish Roman Catholic aristocrat. He admits to some prejudice against the Jews. And then he says, you know, it actually was quite wonderful because these Jewish leaders I was meeting in the outside of the ghetto, they were not at all Jewish. You know, they were like Polish gentlemen. And then the moment they go into the ghetto, they slip through a, through a door, uh, through the wall, in a house and things like that, and suddenly they became Jewish. They were amongst themselves. And it's very interesting because I have an incredible love and admiration for Karski, but also for the fact that in some way he both, he both, um, he both recognizes his prejudice and then also his struggle to transcend his prejudice. Now, Karski, when he goes into Auschwitz, uh, it doesn't go there because of what's happening to the Jews. I mean, Auschwitz at that moment is not important in the final solution, but it becomes quite important. And since we are here speaking at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, I just think that maybe it would be a good thing to for a moment consider uh, Pilecki's kind of relationship to what was known in Poland as the Jewish problem. And, and the way he struggles with that. That's a, it's a great question, Robert Jan. And, um, you know, it's one that I really felt I needed to tackle in the book, you know, straight away. And that's really to situate Pelecki in this, in pre-war Poland, which was multi-ethnic, diverse, the largest Jewish population in the world. Warsaw was just this, you know, melting pot of, ideas and culture, um, but it was also a scene of anti-Semitism. And um, I think one thing that I came to understand over the course of research is that it's important to draw a distinction between Polish anti-Semitism pre-war and that of the Nazis. I think when you say anti-Semitism, you just tend to think about, you know, a road towards Nazi ideology. And that, that wasn't uh, what life was like in in um in pre-war poland there were you know nasty vitriolic material appearing in the press there was a uh, a campaign to have uh, polish jews emigrate to israel and there were you know various different types of discrimination and you know Pletsky was that was partly his world he came from a conservative Catholic background. Um, I found no evidence to suggest that he held anti-Semitic views. Um, but I think even had I done, um, what I think makes his story so important is that he left that all behind in his journey to the camp. And he found a way 
to reach beyond his immediate circle of friends, beyond his immediate conception of being Polish and who he was in order to risk his life to report on crimes against Soviet POWs and then crimes against uh, Jewish families brought to the camp for extermination. And so that for me posed such an interesting question that I think is so relevant for all of us today. How do we reach beyond our immediate concerns in order to emphasize, empathize with the suffering of others? That's Palecki's challenge to us and what I think his story can, can really can really teach us. And um, yeah, and probably, yeah, I actually have a question for you, which I've, has always um, interested me. I thought you just brought this to a beautiful end right now. So I just was about <laughs> to suggest Samantha close the meeting. But if you have one question for me, fine. Well, I mean, Jan Karski, I mean, I think many on the court, you know, here will know his name and he's rightly celebrated as this, you know, remarkable Polish courier who took news of the Holocaust it was as, as it was unfolding in 1942 and did such an incredible job of bringing that to the Allies. Um, what I wanted to, and, and you know, he's rightly celebrated the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. He's a, no, a well-known name. We know, of course, many reasons why Paletsky's name is not well-known um, because of that suppression um, uh, during communism. But I, I was just wondering why um, since the 90s, when his, his material has been sort of widely available, why has he not been uh, you know, sort of celebrated in the same way. Why did it take, why was it <laughs> until now that we're finally talking about this remarkable man? Now, you know, my, my sense, and, and this is pure speculation, but I think that if we're looking at the, the history of research at the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum, yeah, uh, an enormous, they have a really good research department, they have excellent historians. Um, but uh, uh, my sense is a little bit that there was an enormous amount of emphasis in their research department on resistance throughout the 19, resistance in the camp in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, and that in some way um, that, you know, many publications appear at a time that the name Pilecki could not be mentioned because he was persona non grata. And I think that in some way the the, 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 the emphasis on resistance in the, let's say, communist era in the Auschwitz Museum's research enterprise, which in some way still is the core, I think, of much research done being, being on Auschwitz. And you always refer to what actually the research department in Auschwitz is doing, that at a certain moment when we come into the, let's say, the late 1990s, when the name of Pilecki, you know, now becomes more known, uh, you know, street, uh, uh, you know, in Oswinsim that leads to the museum is now named after Pilevsky and so on. But that in some way the research focus and, uh, and in some way the, the, the focus of the, uh, of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum had shifted away from the issue of resistance. So I think that in some way the, uh, the um, that, that in some way the, 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 the discovery of Pilevsky's activities in some way came too late for the kind of natural flow of what the Auschwitz Museum was actually, uh, what, what, what material they were working on. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the, 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 the research, that, that a new focus on research in their work, I think, would certainly uh, probably center, center on, um, on, uh, on Pilecki. But there were many things that, you know, when we're looking at also the kind of ebb and flow of themes uh, and research in the whole history of the Holocaust, where, uh, where we are looking at different things today than we look, look 20 years ago. I mean, nowadays, of course, uh, gender studies, uh, you know, have, are very much informing our, our idea of what actually are the white spots in our knowledge. I mean, we realize you know, at a certain moment in the 1990s, after looking for 40 years on the history of Auschwitz, people started to realize they only had looked at men and they never looked at women in Auschwitz, yeah? And so at a certain moment, it took time actually for that research focus to get, to get, to get basically to, to, to become mature and for, for the work to be done. So I certainly think that 
uh, it is probably time a generation later for a new kind of consideration of the, of, of the question of research in Auschwitz. And I think there are many unanswered questions. I think especially the relationship of, let's call it, uh, Polish, Roman, Catholic, Christian uh, resistance groups versus the Jewish resistance groups and the relationship between th th these two um, uh, resistance in Auschwitz won the main camp and Auschwitz-Birkenau. I think there's still a lot of mythification around that relationship. But I think that certainly once resistance comes back on the agenda, uh, that he will be a central character in, in, in all of that. That would be at least my, my, my explanation. And I must admit that, you know, uh, the first book I wrote was The Boer at War, which was really conceived in the 1980s, written in the early 1990s. Pilecki is, is not mentioned in that book. And ultimately, you know, in my later work, he is mentioned, but certainly after your book, <laughs> he, he, he will become an even greater character in whatever narrative I will might write in the future about Auschwitz. Now we are now at a little after three. So I think that we've used up uh, everyone's time. So I, I really would like to thank you very much for, for this excellent presentation, even if we had some issues with the, with the slides, I think. And so um, I'm going to give it back to you, Samantha. Thank you, Robert Jan. Thank you, Jack. Uh, just to echo what Robert Jan said, this was an incredible presentation. Thank you, Jack, for the, the work that you've done. Uh, and, and everyone watching, please go out and buy Jack's book. Um, I know we have a lot of questions that came in that we didn't have time to get to today, but hopefully uh, you can find your answers to your questions in Jack's book. Uh, it's available now in Politics and Prose. Um, and also amazon.com. So I'll be sending out those links in the coming days, um, in addition to more information about um, Jack and more information about uh, our upcoming public programs. We're continuing to do these programs twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, Eastern time. So um, stay tuned for more. And thank you guys again. This was really phenomenal.